Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, CSIS. Uh, my name is uh, Victor Cha. I'm the uh, Senior Advisor and Career Chair here at CSIS and Professor at Georgetown University. And I want to thank you all for joining us uh, today for a very special gathering of uh, policymakers, um, opinion leaders, and stakeholders on the topic of North Korean human rights and the nexus with security issues. Um, uh, we have a full day uh, today that will uh, commemorate the two-year anniversary of the publication of the United Nations Commission of Inquiry report uh, and subsequent UN actions to address uh, North Korean human rights violations. Uh, our speakers and panelists will discuss accountability for North Korean human rights abuses, Feature will be featuring new data and research. Um, we will examine the link between human rights and national security, and we will look at the policy prospects for 2016 as we seek to deepen our understanding of how to improve the human condition in North Korea and how to formulate practical solutions. Um, <clears throat> um, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the wonderful organizations uh, that have worked with us in putting together uh, this event. You'll be hearing from representatives from each of them in a moment. Um, but the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, HRNK, uh, the uh, George W. Bush Institute, uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, and the Yonsei Center for Human Liberty have all uh, worked very hard for, uh, to put on this uh, this discussion for you today. Um, and I also want to especially thank um, uh, my friend uh, and supporter of uh, CSIS, jung An Kim, and his wife, Jane Kim, for also uh, supporting the work of uh, CSIS, particularly in this area. Um, before I begin, I need to share with you our building, building safety precautions overall. Um, CSIS feels very secure in our building, but as a convener, we have a duty to prepare for an eventuality. Uh, CSIS staff, who are all in the back of the room, will serve as your responsible safety officers at this event. Um, should anything happen, nothing will happen, but should anything happen, please follow our instructions. Uh, and please take a moment to familiarize yourself with our emergency exit and pathways for this room. Uh, there are um, uh, cards at each of your tables that show you where the exits are. Um, uh, it's pretty clear there are exits behind you, uh, but there are also exits behind the stage here, uh, and we will give you instructions should any need arise. Um, <clears throat> so in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through lengthy introductions of our representatives for our institutions. They're all uh, very well uh, known to you. Uh, Carl Gershman is the president for the National Endowment for Democracy and has been a big supporter of the work on human rights. Uh, Amanda Schnetzer is the Director of Human Freedom at the George W. Bush Institute and uh, has been partnering with CSIS on a number of projects. Uh, Greg Scarlatio is the uh, Executive Director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea and will, has done some very um, uh, really interesting research on the topic that he's going to present today. And then Professor Joseph Phillips from the Yonsei Center for Human Liberty has, joined, has come all the way from Seoul to join us today um, um, to, to represent the center. Um, um, so I would uh, appreciate if each of our um, uh, partners could offer a few remarks uh, to get us started. Uh, um, I'm not sure of the order here. Uh, I think we're starting with Carl. So Great. Carl, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. I guess I can be heard. Okay, good. And um, it's great to be here when it's not snowing. Uh, I assume we'll have more people here than last year because of the snow. And it's uh, just great to be here with uh, Judge Kirby and with my dear old friend, Sonia Biserko. Um, and uh, to reflect two years afterwards on the very, very important work that they've done. <clears throat> the title of this conference and the context in which we're meeting require us to consider the link between human rights and security when dealing with North Korea. Our meeting commemorates the second anniversary of the Commission of Inquiry Report on Human Rights in North Korea 
And it also takes place in the immediate aftermath of North Korea's satellite launch and Kim Jong-un's statement last Saturday that North Korea will launch additional satellites and rockets. Until now, policy discussions on North Korea have generally separated security issues from human rights concerns. Raising human rights problems in, the North, in North Korea has been seen as a sure way to scuttle efforts to resolve the North Korean nuclear problem through negotiations. But we meet at a time when there is growing skepticism about the possibility that such efforts, such negotiations, will produce meaningful results. The problem is not just that many people have given up on the idea of getting China to use whatever leverage it has with North Korea to get to the negotiating table. And certainly no one feels that the six-party talks can be revived. The basic problem is that increasingly, people who follow the North Korea problem are, getting, are coming to the realization that for the regime in Pyongyang, the nuclear issue is an existential matter. It sees having nuclear weapons as necessary for its survival, and that negotiating them away, whatever economic and political benefits it might receive as trade-offs, would be suicidal. This rocket launch has been a kind of shock of recognition for those who have been reluctant to acknowledge the importance that North Korea attaches to possessing a nuclear arsenal. The basic issue, therefore, is the nature of the North Korean regime, which brings us to the question of human rights. The idea that human rights and international security are intimately linked is not new. It was the core belief of Dr. Andrei Sakharov, the physicist and Soviet dissident, who said in his Nobel lecture in 1975 that disarmament and international security, and this is a quote, are inconceivable without an open society with freedom of information, freedom of conscience, the right to publish, and the right to travel freely. In an essay he wrote in 1977 for the Norwegian Nobel Committee, he noted that the human rights issue is not simply a moral one, but also a paramount practical ingredient of international trust and security. North Korea is the most oppressive example in the world today of what another former Soviet dissident, Natan Sharansky, has called a fear society, meaning a country where the government maintains control by instilling fear in the hearts of everyone it rules over. What is different about North Korea is that it is the regime itself that is afraid, afraid of the modern world, afraid of the free Korean society across the border, afraid of its own people. The fact that such a paranoid regime uses the possession of nuclear weapons to try to guarantee its survival makes it, to say the least, exceedingly dangerous. This conference will discuss aspects of the two necessary components of a policy to deal with such a regime. The first is to contain North Korea by deterring its aggressive behavior. And the second is to change it by defending the human rights of the North Korean people. That means doing what we can to end their isolation from the outside world, to empower them and to give them a voice in determining their country's future. Only then 
Might there emerge from within the country's elite people who realize that the current system is doomed and who want to seek a peaceful way to a better future. It's important that specialists in both the security and the human rights areas of policy on North Korea have come together at this conference for a common discussion of, this, of the issues that I've described. It's also appropriate that this conference will conclude with the first Freddie Clay Memorial Lecture to be delivered this evening by Michael Kirby, who chaired the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea. Dr. Clay was America's leading defense intellectual and also the founding chair of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. When the committee was launched in September 2001, soon after the 9-11 attacks, Dr. Clay said that it would focus on internal liberalization in North Korea as a way to address the concern over state-sponsored terrorism. In the end, he said, and this was in the founding press release of the organization, democracy and the rule of law, desirable in and of themselves, are also a guarantee of peace and security. That is the comprehensive vision that will guide our discussions today. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Amanda? Thank you, Victor. Good morning. Um, I bring you greetings from Dallas, Texas at the George W. Bush Institute. It's wonderful to be here on a cool, chilly Friday morning in Washington. I've promised several of you already to send some 70 degree weather your way from Dallas, so it's coming. Um, we're really delighted to be a part of this conference again. It's um, becoming a tradition and one that I think is really important in terms of helping keep the spotlight and the momentum going from the extremely important work that Justice Kirby and others released two years, almost two years ago um, this, this week. I want to thank our partners, um, all of them, for working with us and allowing us to be a part of this important event. And so we, my thanks to all of you. The, at the Bush Institute, we have a part of our work devoted to human freedom, and our mission and our work is fairly straightforward in the sense that we work to help develop young leaders in emerging democracies. And we work to stand with individuals who continue to live under conditions of tyranny. And we also advocate for US leadership and the leadership of other free societies to continue to support those who have a vision for freedom and democracy in their own countries. And our work on North Korea for the last two years has been a part of that. We undertook our efforts two years ago because we understood that the United Nations Commission of Inquiry was going to be releasing a groundbreaking report. And we wanted to do what we could to help get the word out and to help sustain the momentum that was sure to come and has come from the release of that important report. It was also the 10-year anniversary of the North Korean Human Rights Act, which President Bush signed in 2004 and has had important bipartisan support across this city since then. Um, so we're a part of this because what is being discussed at this conference today is very consistent with the work of the Bush Institute and with the principles that have guided our founders for the, the length of their entire years of public service. And it's particularly consistent with the interest and the deep commitment that President Bush has had to the North Korean people and wanting to do what he has been able to do both as president and now in his private life um, to support the people of North Korea. And so instead of more words from me, I actually have a message for you from President Bush. So from him, his words. Greetings to those gathered in Washington, D.C. for this important conference on national security and North Korea's human rights record. 
Two years ago this week, Justice Michael Kirby and his colleagues at the United Nations Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in the DPRK released a groundbreaking report documenting crimes against humanity in North Korea and calling on the world to act. The magnitude of human suffering detailed by survivors and eyewitnesses should be unacceptable in the 21st century or at any point in human history. The North Korean people are terrorized by fear, torture, deprivation, and political prison camps. Missiles and weapons tests like those in recent weeks are meant to terrorize North Korea's neighbors and the world. The two are closely connected. Like many of you, the Bush Institute is focused on helping improve the lives of the North Korean people, both those who have, both those who have escaped and those who remain beyond, behind Pyongyang's Iron Curtain. We believe that better integrating human rights issues with the mainstream security strategy is part of the answer and is in our national interest. Addressing one of the greatest human, human tragedies and security threats of our time should unite us all. Laura and I join you in repeating the call to stand with the North Korean people and send you best wishes for a successful conference. May God bless you all. Thank you. Greg. Thank you, Victor. Good morning and greetings from Connecticut and K Street Northwest, the Committee for Human <laughs> Rights in North Korea. Uh, this is a very important year for our committee, for HRNK. Fifteen years ago, co-chair emeritus Roberta Cohen, Carl Gershman, the late Freddie Clay, and our other founding board members had a vision for an organization that would be tasked to research, to investigate, to publish on the North Korean human rights situation because today we have the UNCOI report, but back in the day, 15 years ago, this group of uh, most distinguished scholars and former government officials and private sector representatives realized that there was a serious gap in research on this particular topic. I'm very pleased to report to you today that our organization has published 30 reports since. And since our last meeting about a year ago here at CSIS, we have published a total of eight reports focusing primarily on North Korean leadership dynamics under Kim Jong-un uh, and also on North Korea's political prison camps to the great work of our senior advisors, David Hogg, Joe Bermudez, they're here in the audience today. Uh, we have continued to perform our mission and uh, we sometimes reminisce that this is the organization that first proposed UN Security Council action on North Korean human rights in 2006, our report entitled Failure to Protect. Um, during that very intensive year when the UN COI was conducting its investigation, this organization was fully engaged with the commissioners and their wonderful staff members. And uh, post-UNCOI, as we have taken these very important steps to implement, to move toward the implementation of the UNCOI recommendations, our organization has continued to stay connected, has continued to stay engaged with so many other NGOs that have done such wonderful work, many of them represented here today. Our role has continued to be to provide the critical information needed to reach out to UN agencies, reach out to UN country missions, reach out to others in order to inform them in the process of pushing for strong Human Rights Council resolutions, strong General Assembly resolutions, action at the Security Council, and at the very least now we know that this issue has been placed on the agenda of the Security Council twice. And we also know that our own ambassador to the United Nations, Ambassador Samantha Power, gave uh, last December what was probably one of the most powerful speeches ever given by a senior U.S. government official on this particular topic of North Korea, North Korean human rights. Uh, it goes without saying that it's an extraordinary honor, a privilege, and a great pleasure to work once again with our friends and colleagues at CSIS at the George W. Bush Institute, um, at the National Endowment for Democracy, and although Ambassador Lee Jong-un is not here today, surely the center is represented, 
the Human Liberty Center at Yonsei University. This issue used to be seen as a fringe issue just a few years ago. What the UNCOI has done has been to change this paradigm, change the discourse on North Korean human rights. And now the very fact that this conference is happening, the very title of this conference and all the panels that are lined up here today at CSIS of all places are testament to the fact that human rights has continued to gain attention and we are on our way to placing human rights where it should be, on a par with the other extraordinarily important issues, North Korea's nukes, missiles, military provocations, grave threats to regional and international peace and security. Thank you very much. Joe. Thank, thank, thank you, Professor Cha. I, uh, I appreciate uh, the introduction. I think I'm probably someone up here who did need a longer introduction. I'm, I know I'm not known to most of you, uh, but as Professor Cha said, I'm a professor uh, in uh, South Korea and uh, have worked uh, for some years with uh, Ambassador uh, Lee, and uh, I'm a research fellow at the uh, Yonsei uh, Human Liberty Center, and that's the capacity I'm, I'm uh, in here today to uh, represent the center and Ambassador Lee in welcoming you to uh, this conference and in extending our appreciation to uh, the HNR, uh, HRNK and the Bush Institute and NED, and particularly to uh, Professor Cha and the CSIS for once again organizing a conference like this. Since uh, 2014, our center has worked to spotlight the crimes against humanity occurring in North Korea. And one of our proudest accomplishments is a recent accomplishment, uh, our conference last November, which many of you attended. Uh, we called it the Seoul Dialogue. And the goal of that conference was to bring together diplomats and um, academics and policymakers and politicians to put forth concrete proposals for actuating uh, the Commission of Inquiry report. Uh, everyone here today is of course, focused on protecting uh, North Koreans against their brutish government, um, but uh, I uh, want to just add that uh, this, of course, is not just a fight for North Koreans. Uh, the uh, issues that we're dealing with here now are relevant to all of us. Uh, if the international human rights regime cannot protect the most vulnerable people, the weakest people uh, in North Korea from what are uh, crimes uh, unparalleled in the contemporary world, then of course uh, that makes us all vulnerable to human rights abuses. So uh, thank you all for coming today on behalf of the center, on behalf of Prof uh, Professor Ambassador Lee, thank you for coming today. and. Um, uh, thank you for helping ensure that uh, the hard-fought standards uh, for human dignity uh, uh, that uh, we accomplished in the 20th century continue to matter in the 21st century. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we will move directly into our first panel, so um, I, would, I would ask that our um, uh, Michael, Sonia, and Sinia, if you could join us on the stage. a separate person.
Okay, so to, um, to get us started, we thought it would be very nice to do our first panel with people who are really at the forefront of the international effort with regard to um, um, the human rights issues in North Korea and uh, emphasize that this has been truly an international effort uh, over the past uh, several years. Um, the uh, speakers at, the, uh, at our podium here are certainly no strangers to any of you who have been following this issue, but let me introduce them uh, briefly. Uh, Michael Kirby, uh, who was with us as well last year, very well known to all of you, is chair of the United Nations Commission of Inquiry and Human Rights in North Korea since 2013. Uh, when he retired as Justice of the High Court of Australia in 2009, uh, where he had served since 1996. He was the uh, Australia's longest serving judge. Um, in a brief, our brief chat this morning before we started the conference, uh, Michael was telling me about his new assignment, his new work, um, and uh, I'm certain that he will be as effective and as penetrating and as groundbreaking in his new work as he will, as he has been on the North Korean uh, human rights issue. Um, sitting beside him is Sonia Becerco. Uh, Sonia also was with us last year. Um, she is founder and president of the Helsinki Committee for Human Rights in Serbia and a member of the United Nations Commission of Inquiry and Human Rights in North Korea. Um, she uh, previously was a senior fellow at the United States Institute of Peace here in Washington from 2000 to 2001 and has received numerous rewards, including the Human Rights Award of the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights in New York in 1994, the Human Rights Prize of the City of Weimar, Germany in 2009, and the Human Rights Award of the University of Oslo in 2010. Uh, Senia Polson currently serves as representative of the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, Ms. Polson joined the UN in 2005 and has served in various um, uh, OHCHR and United Nations peacekeeping presences, including as a human rights officer in Liberia, head of the monitoring and protection unit of the human rights and transitional justice section in the UN mission in Timor-Leste, and the OHCHR mission in southern Kyrgyzstan, uh, among other assignments. And she uh, uh, has joined us from Seoul, so thank you very much, all of you, for traveling a long distance to join us today. Okay, is my mic working now? Yes, it's working now. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so um, um, what I'd like to do is have a discussion about... Um, uh, so we were here uh, a year ago on a very snowy day um, talking about the progress that had been made since the report that Senia Michael and Marsuki Daruzman um, had done on the U.S. Uh, on North Korean human rights abuses, and Michael, I'd like to start with you, if I could, and ask you. Now that we're two years since the report, uh, I know that you've been very hard at work all over the world talking about this issue. I would like to get your own reflection on where you think we are now, uh, and uh, are you satisfied with where we are now, and what more needs to be done? Uh, never satisfied in the struggle for universal human rights, um, we will never be satisfied, but our duty is to continue the effort to build the world that Eleanor Roosevelt envisaged, that the United Nations uh, conceived uh, in the uh, Charter and in the Universal Declaration and in all the treaties that have followed. And it is important to say, because uh, sometimes there is a feeling in this city and in all of our cities that the United Nations lets us down. Uh, in the exercise of the Commission of Inquiry on North Korea, everything that should have been done in accordance with the Charter was done. And this is an example of where the United Nations operated in the manner that the Charter uh, and the great human rights treaties envisaged and the work is going on. Uh, some people uh, suggest to me that uh, really uh, because uh, it hasn't proved possible to have the Security Council refer the case of North Korea 
to the International Criminal Court, which was a key recommendation for accountability. This session is about accountability. Uh, that because that hasn't happened, that therefore the whole exercise has failed. Well, that would be to make a serious mistake. Because even if the Commission of Inquiry never resulted in a single prosecution, which I am far from believing will be the case, but even if that were the case, by giving voice to individual victims of horrible crimes against humanity, uh, the Commission of Inquiry and its methodology uh, ensured that people would be given the chance to speak to the very highest level of the United Nations and to people of the world about the great wrongs. That itself has a value and it has meant that the world now has the record of what is going on. And when we were attacked by DPRK, as we knew we would be attacked, our methodology stood us in good stead. Effectively, it was the Anglo-American methodology of inquiries, public sittings, public hearings, bringing people out in public to give their stories, testimony recorded on video, testimony on the internet, uh, transcripts available for everyone to see, uh, and uh, opportunities for ordinary citizens to have a look at what the victims were saying and to judge whether it was true or false. And I think that was a very important step forward. And in fact, I go next week to Geneva where there is a conference which is going to be addressing the methodology of COIs and the lessons that are to be learned for inquiries into human rights around the world. So uh, I think, where are we now? I think Carl Gershman summed it up. We know uh, the nature of this regime. We know that uh, pious thoughts that we could persuade them to uh, come along with um, denuclearization are not going to happen. And therefore, we know where we stand and we know where the victims stand uh, and therefore we can have a healthy dose of realism and the value of today is to see the interaction, the intense uh, interaction between universal human rights uh, and p uh, international peace and security, the two great objectives of the United Nations system. So uh, I'm very grateful to the organising bodies that have brought us all together uh, and uh, Good progress has been made. We know where we stand. We know what the goals are. Uh, and our job is to chart the next 12 months and the 12 months after that and to keep coming back until ultimately liberty, freedom and universal human rights are available to every person in uh, Korea. Thank you. Um, the um, senior, the, um, you st stood up this new office now in Seoul. Um, could you, well, first, can you tell us, one, how it's going? Uh, and two, um, what are the sort of challenges that you see going forward? And what do you see as the objective of this office that you have now uh, been asked to, to lead in South Korea? What is it that you're seeking to do? Yeah, so, so the office was, was formally inaugurated in, in late June last year and, and started working at, at that time, um, more or less, uh, mm -hmm. but still setting up a bit. But, but um, in essence, the, the office came about as, as, as a direct consequence of recommendations made in, in the COI, and which were then taken up by uh, member states and the Human Rights Council and, and so on. Um, the office is set up to follow up on the findings of the COI report. Um, but also uh, has a, a broader mandate than that uh, given to it in the Human Rights Council resolution. So we do, in addition to monitoring and documentation, which, which is very important and which we will continue to do, 
Um, we also seek to continue the visibility of this issue, so to continue to raise it in, in different types of media, with different organizations and in different outreach um, capacities. Also, at, at times, uh, focusing on certain issues that, that need highlighting or, or that where we feel that more could be done. Um, we also do a, a bit of uh, capacity building, as, as we call it in, in UN language, but, but uh, working with civil society, with governments, with others, uh, to uh, increase uh, capacity to promote and protect uh, the rights of persons in, in the DPRK. Um, and all of this, I think it's very important to say, builds, of course, on, on the many years and in some cases decades of civil society and others who've been working much longer. Uh, and then we have the COI as, as an important contribution. And, and now we have the office who can hopefully continue or who will be able to continue that work in the longer term for, for as long as it takes. Mm -hmm. And so how big is the office now? Um, the, the office has six staff. Uh -huh. At the moment, uh -huh. yeah. And they're all Korean speakers and? Uh, no, they're not all Korean speakers. Uh -huh. um, the, <laughs> um, they, they, um, there are Korean speakers on staff. We also have interpretation that, that includes an interpreter uh -huh. also. Um, and uh, we're working on the Korean, but it's not the easiest language uh -huh. to move to. Move to. <laughs> well, good, good. Um, uh, Sonia, you've um, both <clears throat> worked on the UN COI Commission with Michael and, Mar and Marsuki, uh, but you've had lots of other experiences with um, uh, human rights in Serbia and elsewhere. Um, I'd like to get your reflections as well on um, the, the report itself, the impact it's made, mm -hmm. uh, and then what you see in particular as the challenges ahead based on your own experiences in dealing with these sorts of issues in, in other cases. Oh, thank you. I think it's a very complex and long process ahead of each society, including North Korea. I'll just remind you that Bastioni report was the report which was essential for setting up the ICTY. And that uh, ICTY is already in place for 20 years. ICJ also con uh, conducted few trials relating to Yugoslav crisis. But unfortunately, I must say, uh, this, uh, tri this, uh, the work of these uh, international courts did not have the impact on the society in terms of changing the values. Uh, it's not ready for it. First of all, because we don't have an elite which would be ready to be a transmission or to incorporate uh, judgments from these courts into the legal system of Serbia and to introduce these values, because we are talking about the values. And uh, uh, transition justi justice concept is something which is at the very beginning. We had many cases all over the world, different commissions, tribunals, and I would say the results were always halfway because in first place of the character of the societies and the character of the changes in these societies, whether they were violent, uh, whether they were uh, uh, incited by the people themselves or inside the regime. Most of these uh, changes, like in Serbia, were from inside the structures, which I believe probably may take the place in North Korea because so far we don't have any, I would say, information how the society functions, whether there are uh, resistance to this character of the, of the regime, its um, repression and terror, which is going on for 70 years. I would also emphasize uh, the nature of uh, society's uh, values. And when we talk about North Korea, we have to have in mind that it was isolated country for 70 years based on the stereotypes against Japanese, South Koreans, uh, uh, Americans, and others. In order to reach these people with this new concept, you have to de deconstruct these stereotypes. And it's not easy. It's deeply in their culture. And when you have in mind the history of North Korea, then it's easy to understand why that is so. And I think in Serbia, now all these judgments coming from the uh, ICTY are received by the public in, in, in the country as something anti-Serbian, something which is uh, in the meantime relativized. So Milosevic is not a war criminal in the, in the uh, memory of most of the people in Serbia. He is someone who was sacrificed by uh, or 
accused uh, unri unjust, unrightly by the Western beca West because they wanted to destroy Serbia as a very important country for I don't know for what reason. But this is you can meet this on daily basis in our public discourse through media, electronic media, and also in academia. Mo many of our intellectuals from academia are really treating the world in the former Yugoslavia and the sensibility of uh, Serbia in that way. So uh, I think by, uh, we have one face behind us when we talk about North Korea, and this is enormous effort which was put into establishing the commission and producing this report, and I think this is a great success. But from now on, I think there has to be more mechanisms being uh, introduced to deal with society itself, its values. And it's a question whether the, uh, the urge for debate about evil and good will come from the society. I, I doubt it, because uh, once the regime is over, most of the people will be concerned with their existential problems, and this is normal, this is human. So the justice is not uh, going to be the first demand, or may, may not be the first demand coming from the society, because they want to organize their lives in different way, they will want this and that. So I think, and also the judicial justice is not the full truth. And I think it's extremely important to engage in analyzing uh, the context of the North Korean society to make people understand why they live in the regime, such regime for so long. Because without understanding, especially for the younger people, younger generations will, which, which will be coming in place after the changes take place, we don't know when and how, it will be important to understand this horrific past over the 70 years, and over the whole century. You know, the history of uh, Korean Peninsula is really uh, horrific in many ways. And to, do, to deal with that needs a really a very wise and very responsible elite, and I'm afraid the whole region is not engaged in um, some kind of uh, historic uh, uh, history analysis in a way it should. There is a lot of revisionism in the entire region, China, Japan, South and North Korea. And this is also making, creating a problem because they all live in some kind of stereotypes of each other and nothing much is moved uh, ahead in terms of un having a common understanding or objectivizing the history of the region. Thanks. Well, I mean, that's, th those are very important observations, and they help us to really diagnose one of the key problems when we think about the human rights issue in contact with the North Korean regime. Michael, I'm, I'm wondering, so in your mind, how uh, we certainly know what the issues are, but how does one, how does the international community begin to engage on this problem with North Korea? We, the international community can engage with each other on this issue, but what, what do you see as the possibility of engaging with the regime, as flawed as the regime is? Um, well, on, on one of the uh, lovely gifts that was waiting for me in the Cosmos Club when I crossed the whole world to come here uh, was from Roberta Cohen, who's always so thoughtful in these matters. First, there was a bowl of beautiful flowers uh, to greet me, and then on the pillow was a book called The Collapse, and it's the story of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And during our work on North Korea for the uh, Commission of Inquiry, uh, we could and did never suggest that the solution to the issues of North Korea was the collapse of the regime. The DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, is a member of the United Nations. We were a body of the United Nations. It was not open to us, and it would not have been proper for us to say the answer is that a member of the United Nations has to disappear and be absorbed in another member of the United Nations. That would not have been proper, and we never said it. But one of the points that's made in the book is that uh, the change came about in Germany, uh, not ultimately because of external pressure, but because of the build-up within uh, uh, the Democratic uh, German Republic, DDR, uh, of uh, a great strength of feeling, so that when a couple of mistakes were made by the regime, uh, the people could seize the opportunity and take advantage of it and move 
very quickly to assert their freedoms and to recapture their human rights. Now, I don't know how that's going to happen uh, in uh, DPRK, but uh, I think it's very important uh, that we should be concentrating on getting news and information and including the information about what the world has found about their regime, what the COI has said about it. Uh, the Republic of Korea has been very circumspect about this and rather reluctant uh, to support uh, very strong steps to bring news into North Korea, but I think that period is now over and that real efforts have to be made to bring the information to the people in all the places of uh, North Korea through radio, through a satellite, uh, through the internet, uh, on uh, little chips that can go into the three million cell phones. Uh, and even this morning, John Fox, who's here and who's always a source of a lot of very good ideas, told me something I didn't know, and it was that uh, Anne Frank uh, began her diary because the BBC started uh, broadcasting the uh, recommendation that everybody who was suffering in Europe should begin a diary, should begin keeping a record, should begin recording the outrageous things that were happening to them. And I think that's something we can learn from and we should be putting the message into North Korea uh, uh, to keep carefully a diary, to keep the record to gather the information, and the message has to go into North Korea, accountability will come. Uh, there will be a place in the sun after uh, the end of the terrors of the present moments uh, for most people in North Korea. Uh, they will go about their lives and they may stay in government and they may have positions of responsibility, but those who are guilty of egregious crimes against humanity will be rendered accountable. And I think it's very important that these messages, simple messages, should be put forward. Keep a diary. Remember, this is a path we are on that will end up in liberty and uh, ensure that uh, those who are guilty of great crimes know that they will be rendered accountable, but that others will not be rendered accountable because of the fact that the life goes on and the, the less egregious crimes can be dealt with in other ways. But uh, we, we must not surrender the importance of accountability because that is not only the way we solve North Korea, but it's the way we prevent future North Koreas happening. And this is the work of the field office, is collecting more of this information. And this is a systematic careful, time-consuming, but ultimately successful endeavour which we have to put in place. Sonia, do you want to say something on this as well? On, on well, that? I agree that evidence collected is of extreme relevance because what, for example, in our case, ICJ and ICTY have uh, as a legacy is extremely important for the future. It takes new generation, I would say, which will be making the use of that. And uh, I would say that in our case, we had so many NGOs and so many people working with and uh, dealing with the past in uh, different ways. And it is already extremely important legacy of all of us in the region and the uh, international courts. But uh, uh, you know, the future identity of, of the nation is going to be built, hopefully, on these facts, and which are already there. Uh, as I said, it really depends on the elites, whether they will be ready and prepared to take this into account, to sort of reveal the truth about the regime, about the country, and so on. So I, I, I really support, uh, first of all, the continuation of the Commission's work through the office in Seoul and uh, uh, collecting the evidence by all means. And I think all these efforts made by different organizations here, especially radio stations, they do reach, but uh, as I say, uh, it's very important to have in mind this legal culture of the societies and culture in general. And because legal culture in these societies is not something which is uh, known here in the West. It takes time to teach, to 
uh, familiarize them with this concept. So I think uh, I'm just saying that it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, when we think about accountability, as both Michael and Sonia said, I mean, one of the avenues for doing that is some sort of messaging or contact with the people in North yeah. Korea. Like you said, like diaries, um, uh, contact even with, um, with uh, enlightened elites, if you will. But we're actually heading into a period right now where it looks like, given the nuclear test in January, the missile test, um, the president's, President Obama signing into, into law of the sanctions, US sanctions, the UN Security Council sanctions, we're heading into a period where, if anything, it looks like the world's gonna cut themselves off or cut North Korea off from any sort of contact. Um, and although there will be humanitarian carve-outs, I think, in any sanctions bill or sanctions resolution, um, it, it seems like the level of contact is gonna get lesser in the future, not more. And so how do we, I guess the question is, how do you manage that, that balance when at the one hand, you have the, these high, the sort of high politics imperatives to sanction the regime, but at the same time, a very important part of the human, human rights agenda in terms of accountability is, is being able to have some sort of communication with those who, are, who, are, who want to keep a record who, or who want to uh, be enlightened. I think it's this. important to keep in mind that we three are human rights people, and though human rights is intimately connected, particularly in the case of DPRK, with security issues, uh, nonetheless, we can't overstep our uh, expertise and uh, at the work we have done to move into areas that really require a different uh, and sharper focus of uh, geopolitical security knowledge and expertise. Uh, and, of course, in the case of Sonia and myself, our mandate is up. And we don't now have a mandate for the United Nations, and it's therefore important that we don't purport to speak for the United Nations. We've spoken in our report, uh, and that is uh, our uh, discharge of our mandate. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's self-evident that... Uh, you, you have to learn, wasn't there a president of which it was said in this country that you've got to learn to chew gum and do something <laughs> else uh, at Walk the same time? Gum. I won't, won't go into the detail, but uh, I think uh, the, the countries of the world have to uh, have a multiple approach to the issue. Uh, and the, the plain fact is that uh, having 10 to 20 nuclear warheads and now an increasingly developed missile system is self-evidently very dangerous to human rights. It's very dangerous to the human rights of the people of North Korea themselves because of the risks of accident uh, or mistake, and it's very dangerous to their, uh, their near neighbours. After all, Seoul is only 100 miles down the road, and the roads all lead they only uh, need to be connected one day, as they will be, uh, uh, but it's very close and very dangerous, and same for Japan, and let it be said, the same for China. I don't think we should give up on China. I think there can be continued dialogue with China in respect of the danger that is presented to the Chinese people uh, of this uh, violent, uh, unpredictable uh, regime in North Korea, and the possibility of something being done to render accountable should not be, um, not be put out of mind, and the Security Council's role should not be underestimated. It's very important for people outside the UN system to realise China does not generally do vetoes. In the history of the Security Council, the number of Soviet and Russian Federation vetoes is something like 380. The number of United States vetoes is something like 270. The number of United Kingdom vetoes is something like 70, and French 56, and China 11. Mm. It's not the Chinese way to do international affairs. And they, I think, if it takes time and it takes relentless late nights and constant discussion uh, and the Chinese self-interest. 
Uh, you have in uh, Ambassador Samantha Power a very determined and skillful diplomat. And the United States mission to the United Nations is very strong. And I think it just has to continue with, uh, on a level of dialogue that is different from the level of human rights. And it has to continue uh, on the issue of accountability because that is what will ultimately bore into the mind of people in North Korea who have power that maybe they will one day be rendered accountable. And that may have good consequences for uh, the, uh, not only for the issue of human rights, but for the very dangerous weapon deployment that is now possible in North Korea. So I just think you've got to learn to chew gum and uh, deal with nuclear weapons at the same time. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I think that, that is not beyond the wit and skill of the State Department of the United States and of other uh, countries, and particularly of the, of the P5 members of the Security Council. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Some of, the, some of the sanctions actually that are on the docket, uh, some of the newer sanctions um, do, I think in many ways, do connect the security issues and the human rights issues. I mean, in particular, some of the proposed sanctions on things like commodity exports of coal, you know, have a very direct implication on the way labor is used inside of North Korea. So I think there are elements of the sanctions that do connect the yeah. two. A lot of things are coming together because yeah. when I saw President Park, she emphasized to me over and over again that in every Korean heart beats a, an ardent desire for reunification. There is a belief that whatever the differences on both sides of the border, uh, they could be overcome if only some way of bringing the Korean people together could be achieved. Now, I think what's happened in the last weeks of the closure of the Kaesong uh, facility uh, with arguments both sides, both ways, as to whether that was a good step, given the insidious information that came out every day uh, into DPRK from the workers in Kaesong about the quality of life, the cleanliness of the factories, the discipline and order of the place. Uh, I think that the decision has been made to withdraw from Kaesong. How long for, we don't know, but that is a, a step which I think grows out of the frustration and the sense of outrage of what has been happening. Uh, and therefore, that puts ROK in a position, I think, to uh, more powerfully support getting information into North Korea and not to hold back. ROK was very, very, was opposed basically to the balloons and was, was really rather cautious about putting the news into North Korea. I think that period is over, and I think ROK is now going to support uh, more concerted efforts to get the news into uh, North Korea. And if the book that I'm reading now, uh, thanks to Roberta Cohen, on uh, the Berlin Wall and what happened in Germany is of any guide, um, I think it's into the hearts and minds and knowledge of people in North Korea that we've got to target the messages of human rights wrong and human rights accountability. And uh, I hope that that's going to be the next phase. Uh, but getting on with the discussion in the Security Council and elsewhere about nuclear non-proliferation is a really important step for the future of humanity. And we've just got to keep that up as well. Mm. Um, I want to, I, I, there are a couple of things that I want to talk about. I mean, one of them being methodology, and, I, and I'd like to talk with, about both the COI and the new office. But before doing that, you mentioned China in our discussion of accountability. And I wanted to ask um, uh, both Michael and Sonia. Um, the um, uh, part of it is creating a, an anxiety in China that they need to help on the North Korean issue to create accountability inside of North Korea. To what extent do you think there is pressure on China in terms of their own accountability for the North Korean human rights abuses that are occurring today? I mean, to what extent do you feel that there is an avenue there to create pressure 
so the Chinese feel accountable for what is happening inside of North Korea? Or is that just a bridge too far? Well, I think China is, is a problem, and uh, it seems to be a growing problem. But um, we, we've, we can tap into Chinese self-interest here because it cannot be in the interests uh, of the PRC to have next door a country which is so violent and so unstable and, and is killing and executing leading figures. Jiang Song-tek was probably the second or third most powerful person in DPRK. And he was, as you, we all saw, arrested at a meeting of the Politburo. That is, if I can say so, a very un-Asian way to do business, mm -hmm. to humiliate a person in such a way uh, and to show such instability. And it can only have been done because the Supreme Leader came to the view that this was necessary for domestic purposes. Uh, but uh, his message had been essentially to go down the China route. And he was a friend to China and a friend to the relationship between DPRK and China. Uh, and what has been happening has been really a slap on the face to China. When the uh, matter came before the Security Council last December, uh, the uh, Chinese delegation said, uh, DPR, th this is not a proper matter for the agenda of the Security Council. This should not be here. This is not a matter of peace and security. Uh, DPRK is no threat to the security of the world or the region. And then within days, the fourth test, the atomic test, took place, allegedly a hydrogen bomb. And within a month, the missile was delivered. So that was a real confrontation against China uh, and again made the Chinese statement look ridiculous. Uh, and China must itself feel extremely irritated by this. And more of that is going to, I think, uh, and the prospects of such instability and violence is going to lead China to reconsider what its security and uh, peace interests are. And uh, this is something I believe that careful and painstaking negotiation and discussion with China and finding a formula of words. After all, this is what diplomats are paid good money to do. And this is something I think that should be continued because China doesn't do vetoes and we've got to keep that record in mind. It's not accidental, it's a big statistical difference. And I think we shouldn't give up on some form of accountability mechanism going through the Security Council. Uh, objectively, it should happen. The COI report in the voices of people, this is evidence, it's not just a sort of summation by experts about what happened, these are voices speaking to the world, gives the foundation for doing something. To do nothing is, is really appalling. Uh, and we kept making that point in the COI. Okay, you don't believe in country-specific mandates. We understand that. That was the Chinese and Russian Federation position. We understand it, but once you've got it, uh, we had nothing to do with getting the mandate. We, we had the mandate. We did our job. But once you've got it, it is not rational behaviour to say, well, we don't believe in it being established, therefore we'll ignore what is found. That is not a rational way to act. And therefore, once you've got it and are collecting more and more through the field office, to say do nothing is really a defiance of human rationality and the rational belief of human beings that something has to be done. This is really not acceptable. And I think if the COI did nothing else, it's put this on the agenda and the consciousness of thinking people everywhere on the planet. And that thereby has undermined the strategy that DPRK has had since, uh, since at least 1950 
uh, of closing down the borders, having no contact, allowing very little um, uh, interaction, and uh, thereby avoiding the attention of the world. They now have the attention of the world, and it's the job of everyone in this room and everyone outside uh, who believes in human rights to make sure it doesn't go off the agenda. It's easy to go off the global media agenda. 24-7, they've got new stories. And in this country, you've got some weird and wonderful stories. <laughs> but you've got to keep it on the agenda. And that's what uh, irrational people uh, have to do. Um, senior, um, the two questions. The first is, if you could enlighten us as to what, when we talk about accountability, uh, the work, the substance of what you're doing every day, the substance of what your office is doing, uh, doing every day. I think that would be very, uh, there, that would be very helpful uh, to the group. And then the second thing for you is, um, as you know very well, the, the North Korean human rights issue here in the United States is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, for example, the votes that took place in Congress on HR 757 were unanimous, and at a time when um, there's a little bit of politics going on in our country right now, just a little, right? Um, uh, but uh, the human rights issue in South Korea is a very political and politicized issue. And I guess the question there would be, um, have you encountered that? Uh, and if you have, how does the office manage that? Or is that just something that is not a part of what you should, you see the office as having to deal with? Yeah, I mean, first, I think on, on the methodology, uh, what, what we do on a day-to-day on a -day basis is collect uh, all kinds of information. And, and this is, of course, uh, you know, most, uh, most obviously perhaps collecting testimonies from persons who have left the DPRK and, and come to South Korea, um, following on very much from, from what the Commission of Inquiry also did. Mm -hmm. But that's also supplemented with all kinds of other information that we get from civil society, from, from governments, and, and from others who've been looking at, at the North Korea issue for, for much longer and, and doing analysis on it. And so we try to get together information in, in that way. So, so more or less, that's, that's how we collect our information. Um, Linked to that, and, and it's, it's back to something that, that uh, was also said earlier, of course, accountability and, and ICC is, is not the whole solution. We also need to look at, at these broader you know, systems of, of, of changing hearts and minds, as it were, and, and raising awareness of human rights within North Korea, but also internationally in, in what we're seeking to achieve in North Korea. Um, so we do that through outreach work and, and through capacity building work, and, and that includes, you know, in terms of reaching North Korea, which is a big challenge, and I think in many ways a much bigger challenge than it perhaps was in, in the eastern part of Germany um, uh, because of the nature of, of, of the regime. We do talk to radio stations who we know, for example, are, are transmitting into North Korea. Mm -hmm. we, do, we do try to stay active on social media. Um, this is not, uh, like I said, it, it is a challenge and we, we try to do it in Korean also and, and English. So we have bilingual um, Twitter and Naver and, and other types of accounts. Um, but it's something we will continue to look at uh, and continue with very carefully. Um, on uh, the politics of North Korea and, and how that works, in some ways for us it's very easy. Mm. We stick to the human rights standards. Um, and one of the luxuries of, of being part of the United Nations system is you have those very clear standards that you, that you can stick to. Um, and so we try very hard to, to not align ourselves with, with anyone, but to align ourselves with what those standards say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in a way, that's the bottom line for us. Um, Linked to that, of course, North Korea has ratified a number of these international human rights 
laws and treaties that exist. Um, so that's one measure stick, measuring stick that we can have. They, in 2014, accepted a number of universal periodic review um, recommendations that were made in a peer review by other, nation, uh, other member states of the United Nations. These are things we can link on to and, 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 and follow up on recommendations in that way, in addition to the COI recommendations. And those are because they were accepted voluntarily by the DPRK government, possible inroads. Again, the current um, climate of, of, of uh, defiance against uh, resolutions uh, and these latest uh, tensions are not making that any easier, and, and so in that way probably d impacts uh, negatively on, on human rights engagement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, um, I'm going to ask you and ask you all to respond, and it's kind of a unfair, maybe even a silly question, but do, do you think that Kim Jong-un cares Kim Jong-un, the leader of North, do you think he cares about um, the COI, about uh, this international movement with regard to human rights in North Korea? Um, you know, do you think he cares, and how would we know if he did care? Well, um, I rather deprecate uh, focusing on the peculiarities of the psychology and actions of the Supreme Leader. Uh, there is a bit of a tendency in uh, media, particularly if I can say so, American media, to concentrate on Dennis Rodman, on the Supreme Leader's hairdo, <laughs> on the fact that he has a toilet car that follows him round, and I mean, matters that really are not terribly important but are music. They, they are weird uh, stories and this is concentration on the amusing. Now this is not an amusing story. If you're on the receiving end of the great crimes that are recorded in the COI report, this is not fun, this is not funny, this is deadly serious and it's become more serious in the last few weeks. Uh, and therefore I wouldn't want to speculate, and I, basically I don't want to be disrespectful. He is the supreme leader of the regime that is in power in a country of the United Nations, and I don't think it really advances the cause to uh, specula speculate about what he cares or doesn't care. But the plain fact of the matter is um, he is in a, a form, apparent form of some struggle a political struggle. They go on in democratic countries, they go on in undemocratic countries. And uh, his uh, endeavour to shore up his position uh, has led to some, some steps which I think will be judged in due, due time to have been really ill thought out. And since the COI report came out, um, uh, the matter has definitely been ratcheted up and is on the international consciousness. And that is a good thing. It's a pity our colleague Mazuki Durrisman wasn't here today. Uh, he couldn't come, uh, or we, would, we three would have been together with uh, Sine um, representing the United Nations effort. But uh, the United Nations um, effort has not been disrespectful of the Supreme Leader. Uh, if you read the letter that I wrote to him, which is annexed to the report of the COI, it points to the command principle, which is a principle of international law. If you, being in command, have the power to stop crimes against humanity and do not use your power to stop it, then you are yourself liable in international law for crimes against humanity. And that's why I wrote comma, including possibly yourself, comma. Uh, and when I did that, there were some people in the cautious corridors of the United Nations who suggested, we've never done that before. Do you think that is something we should do? And I said, it is, because this is a matter of law. He, if 
if he has command and doesn't take steps to stop uh, the crimes being done under his administration or power, then he may himself be liable. And I think getting that message over, is there a greater symbol of the international rule of law than the image of the dock in Nuremberg? Than those people who just months earlier had supreme control over the lives and death of millions of people, answering before a dock and the bar of humanity for their great crimes and a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States exceptionally stepped down to prosecute those uh, matters. He went back to the court, but it's, it's a very vivid image and it remains in the, in the consciousness of humanity that even the great and powerful can be rendered accountable for great crimes. We're not talking about lesser crimes great crimes. And that's why I think the question is not what is in his psychology, but what does the law say and will it ever have effect? I think the law is clear and will it have effect? Well, remember Nuremberg. And uh, I, I think that uh, is something that may one day be tested. And uh, meantime, we have to prepare uh, the testimony, we have to prepare the evidence, it has to be gathered, uh, and it has to be kept before the consciousness of human beings everywhere. We must not let this go off the agenda. Uh, and amusing and celebrity issues do tend to come and go, but this is for the long haul. Martin Luther King said, and he's quoted in this book uh, that <coughs> Roberta gave me, uh, we are on a long journey and we must stay the course on this journey and the ultimate destination is clear. And I think that's the message we have to send from Washington. The ultimate destination is clear, but how we get there and when we get there, uh, that's a matter of controversy. Sorry. Well, I, I agree that the report had uh, affected the uh, great leader, and it showed in many cases. First of all, North Korea got engaged in the universal review of, of human rights within the UN. But I think uh, what we mustn't lose from the side the fact that he is in the process of consolidating his position in the country. We don't know who, whether he's puppet or really the leader, and what structures are really behind. And I think this is one of the facts that have to be considered when analyzing even this nuclear test recently, because uh, this is uh, sort of showing him as a strong leader uh, in, in the country. And also closing down the Kai song, I'm afraid it will play into his hands, because it is, he didn't close it, and it affected about 50,000 people. So, uh, I, and he's, I would say, more open than his father uh, towards his own nation and to the world. So I, I don't say that he will be the person who will uh, open up North Korea, but uh, the sensitivity of his position now could, should also be considered. And I would say that unfortunately we do not live in a rational world. There are too many rational decisions, too, too many emotions which are affecting international relations. So I wouldn't uh, uh, just be so sure that there would be always a rational answer to certain problems. And this also relates to North Korean leadership. Yeah. Um, again, I, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult to, to speculate on, on one person, of course. I think what's important and what our office keeps observing is that in the two years that have passed since Justice Kirby sent this letter with the COI report um, to the authorities in, in DPRK, we continue to report and document human rights violations, the same type of violations that, that were documented in the COI report. And in that way, I think, you know, it, it's the actions that really speak loudly here. Um, that's maybe all I would, I would mm. say mm. on that. Okay. Um, can I ask you, um, so uh, some of us in this room, um, I, uh, Hannah and the, a few others, 
participated in an event at Princeton University last weekend. And I mean, Hannah's done this many times, I've done it a few times, but every time I go to university campuses, they don't want to talk about the nuclear issue, right? All they want to talk about is the human rights issue. And so there's an energy among the young people here in the United States on this human rights issue that's really quite, um, I think, it's quite inspiring and it's quite unique, I think. Um, and so I guess the question is, you know, when we think about ways to engage, uh, not the international community, but DPRK on these human rights issues, you know, there are university students in North Korea. And relatively speaking, they're the privileged students in North Korea. Um, to what extent is there any chance of engaging them in caring about their own citizens who are not as fortunate as they are and who have been subjected to you know, working in coal mines or in, 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 in other, you know, other subhuman conditions, I guess. To what extent is that? I know it's kind of out there, but to what extent? I mean, just thinking about the reaction and the, the um, interest that you see among the university students here. Well, I, I think that's a sensible question because uh, if we are to, uh, as it were, build links with rational forces and with people who see a long-term future for themselves and their families and loved ones, um, we've got to look at where the... It's, it's a bit like science, going to the point where you can attack the virus by catching on to something. And, uh, and so when I'm asked what can we do, I say, well, study what has been an area where there's been a little bit of progress. Mm -hmm. Now, family reunion is an area where there has been a little bit of progress. Uh, and it really is a disgraceful thing that people who have uh, family members in their 80s who are uh, on, in the nature of humanity not going to last 50 years uh, are not getting the opportunity to meet each other. Uh, that ought to be possible with funding, with, with the facilities, uh, with um, uh, a bit of cooperation. That ought to be possible because they did agree last year to revive it and it was done um, only after the terrible uh, uh, maiming and wounding of, of young soldiers, but it was done. So I think that's, that's a possibility. Uh, and if we can identify other steps where uh, there has been a little bit of progress. At the end of the COI report is an area which hasn't got a lot of attention, but had a whole series of possibilities. Postal contact, uh, dentists conferences, I mean, why could there not... OK, you may not want to have lawyers meeting because lawyers are troublesome people, <laughs> but why not have um, the, the uh, meeting of, of uh, ophthalmologists or uh, people in, in mm. purely professional disciplines? Uh, it may take initiatives on their part. Within the law, for example, I spoke to Law Asia an organization of lawyers in Asia and the Pacific. And they have actually made contact with the Lawyers Association in North Korea. And they've come to a conference, which has never happened for 50, 40 years. Uh, they came to a conference in Hanoi. So uh, I think this is, these are areas where we should be. Now, as to universities, from what one understands of the universities, that have access to uh, the intranet and the internet, they're pretty tightly controlled, as one would expect. They are the universities which are attended overwhelmingly by the children of the elite. So they're, they're not a cesspool, one would think, of, of original thought. But uh, <laughs> maybe you, our universities should reach out. Mm. Um, why doesn't uh, an orchestra go there and show that Americans are not all barbarians who hate North Korea, but are highly cultured and cultivated people who have some of the greatest 
orchestras of the world. Um, Marcel, who, who was a conductor in the DDR, used to go to the other parts of Germany and uh, that, that created links. There must be Korean artists uh, who, who could safely go into North Korea and perform. Uh, I don't know, but we, we ought to be exploring human-to-human -human contacts. When the chips are down, we are all human beings. We must not hate the people of North Korea. The people of North Korea are our brothers and sisters. And if we can only think along the lines of Victor's question, where are there points where we can build bridges? I think we should be trying to do that. It's difficult and it has been pretty unrewarding, uh, but I think it ought to be done. And as for students, whenever my clerks used to ask me, I want to be a human rights lawyer judge, I want to be a big human rights lawyer, and I would always say to them, you first got to get the black letter skills. It's unfortunate, but true. And so maybe we've got to not make contact with human rights courses, mm -hmm. but with property law courses or intellectual property or international trade courses. Maybe we've got to take initiatives. We've got to not be too proud to make a contact. When we made the contact of Law Asia, it worked. Mm. They responded. Mm. And it may be that their legal association is under the thumb of the government, but at least it's something. And it had the support of the Korean Bar Association in the ROK. So it can be done, and I think your question's on to a good point. We, that was a little section of our report which really hasn't been filled up. Maybe the field office should be, uh, as well as doing its important work of gathering information, it should be thinking and exploring and maybe very quietly exploring ways in which uh, bridges can be built. Because that's what happened in Germany and it was useful. Yeah, and the history of Korea too. Students have always been a big agent of change in, in Korea historically as well. Um, I want to give our audience a chance to ask some questions. We have a few minutes left. So um, the floor is open. If you could raise your hand, identify yourself, and, um, the, and a premium will be placed on asking a question, not, not giving a short speech. So yes, here. Yeah. Yes, hi. This is Tom Fox. Um, whenever, uh, uh, yes, hi, uh, John Fox. Whenever uh, Justice Kirby comes to Washington, I th I'm reminded of that phrase that used to be spoken in my youth. This, this is the voice of your conscience speaking. Okay. Um, I, want, I wonder what you think, uh, Justice Kirby, is the realistic prospect now for a plan B on a tribunal? I didn't hear that. It's not a very good microphone um, system. What, what, in your view, is the uh, plan B for a tribunal for a human rights And what, what are the prospects? Well, the well real... my, my, my view is we should support the special rapporteur. The special rapporteur has said, okay, the COI went through the possibilities, but maybe we didn't think of everything. And maybe we need people who are specifically international lawyers, like a mini international law commission, to have a look at uh, the procedures that could be put in place to uh, render people accountable, a and that is in the latest report of the Special Rapporteur, which is probably not generally available yet, but which is shortly to be um, uh, dis uh, delivered in, uh, in uh, Geneva. So uh, that's what he says should be done. Uh, and uh, I think what, is, what would be unacceptable would be if the United Nations, save for the field office, did nothing, had no plan B, had no uh, effort to continue keeping this matter before the international consciousness uh, with a view to action. Uh, but it has to be said, 
It went up to the, gen the General Assembly. It got a vote of 119 to 19, very strong votes, very strong votes on a human rights issue. Uh, and uh, it then went to the Security Council, not once, but twice. So plan B is to keep the matter uh, bubbling along before the United Nations. It should not go off the agenda. It should be maintained. Uh, and other possibilities, as the Special Rapporteur has suggested, should be pursued. And of course, uh, Marzuki Darisman has announced that he intends to stand down. So we'll have to secure a new Special Rapporteur. And it, it will need a person of, of uh, great persistence, great patience, great courtesy uh, and diligence, all of which Marzuki and uh, Professor Vitit Montaborn, his predecessor from Thailand, had. So I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of wise thought is being given to his successor uh, in the mandate of Special Rapporteur. But uh, Plan B is to keep talking, keep the focus, keep attention, and grab and constantly try to secure the international uh, news media's attention so that uh, this matter doesn't go away until it properly goes away by the end of crimes against humanity and accountability of those who are properly proved to have committed uh, international crimes. Okay. Um, uh, over here, Joe Bosco. Could people check the microphones and speak into the microphone? If you have it like a lollipop, it doesn't <laughs> magnify. You have to speak into it. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Victor, for this uh, excellent conference. And uh, Justice Kirby, thank you and your colleagues for your wonderful work in this critical area. Uh, you placed great stress on the role of China and the fact that uh, you said China does not do vetoes at the uh, Security Council. I think a little nuance uh, needs to be uh, injected there. You recited a, a series of uh, statistics in terms of the numbers of vetoes that countries have, have exercised. But most of the, or many of the Soviet and Russian vetoes were exercised on behalf of China as well. China did not need to exercise a veto since one was enough. Uh, but secondly, behind the scenes, China exerts its pressure on the U.S. and others in the Security Council before the, the matter is brought to a vote, so that a veto is unnecessary in many cases because China has already watered down sanctions and so forth, particularly against, uh, against uh, North Korea. So I wonder if you would uh, take a second look at whether China deserves a little more uh, responsibility for some of the uh, activities in the Security Council that have enabled North Korea to proceed. I still okay. didn't hear the question. Um, so so the, the question was, you cited a statistic on the China's relative lack of uh, using its veto. And Joe's question was essentially, Joe's, Joe's point was essentially that China doesn't need to exercise its veto. It exercises its leverage prior to and through, often through others, whether it's the Soviet Union or Russia or others. Uh, yeah. And therefore, does that, should we not be assigning more responsibility to China with regard to um, 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 uh, this North Korea issue? Yeah. I, I actually think what you were saying was not that. I think you were making a different point than that. But, but can, I, can you keep that um, in your mind? And we're, we're going to get one more question from yeah. the floor. And then, so um, we'll let go to Roberta here, Roberta Cohen, right here up front. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, my questions have to do with the uh, sole office, um, if they can be answered. <laughs> uh, one has to do with um, to what extent the role of the office will be a public one in terms of issuing statements and findings, uh, and whether there will be a role of the Security Council. Um, and the second question has to do with information the first that you send into North Korea. 
um, do you have any plans to send in the texts of these treaties that North Korea has ratified uh, with any explanation? Because sometimes a legal text is a little dry, but at least about what they are. The same thing for the recommendations of the UPR that North Korea has accepted, uh, but sending them into North Korea. And finally, about the COI report itself, which does exist in a Korean version, uh, to what extent is the office circulating that report in South Korea, uh, where I think it also has to be widely read uh, and promoted? Uh, and then is there any effort made to get a commercial and public version of the COI report, something that really can be circulated around the world in different languages, and whether there's also any chance of getting some of that text into North Korea? So why, don't, why don't we go to Senia first to answer these questions from Roberta. Okay, so first maybe on, on the office uh, using its own voice and, and having um, its own statements. Um, certainly the information that we collect will be gathered and, and put out. We, we do have plans, but we do it through the voice of the High Commissioner, of, of course, and in line with how we work. But you will see, for example, in the March session of, of the Human Rights Council, there is a report on the work of the office by the High Commissioner. Um, and there's also a possibility to issue public thematic reports that we plan to take advantage of. I think one of the examples that we can give is on 10th of December, as the Security Council was, was holding their debate, we did a public session for a range of different actors in Seoul on the issue of separated families, but putting it into the framework of, a, of it being not a humanitarian issue, but also a, a human rights issue too. So yes, that kind of outreach we do very much plan on, on doing, um, especially as, as our uh, findings over time grow more solid. Um, on helping to send plans and texts of, of uh, treaties into North Korea, it's something that we've discussed and, and that needs to be done, of course. The question is how to do it most effectively. Um, and, and I would be, it's something we need to, I think, have many more discussions on. Also on the UPR recommendations, some of which are, are quite strong and, and in a way surprising that would be accepted. It, they're not all on, on women and, and food. They're also on things like human rights education for public officials. So how to move forward on that? Yes, the current climate makes it, it more difficult, but we also know if we look in the longer perspective that, that tensions rise and fall over time and, and we shouldn't get maybe caught up in the shorter cycles but in, in the longer ones. So I, I do think there is hope there. As you know, we also have a UN country team working inside North Korea that we are in contact with. Um, they do humanita humanitarian programs, but they're required now as a UN um, agency to work on a human rights-based approach and to put rights up front. So we work with them on, on things like that. These are ways we can, we can put human rights closer to the people of North Korea. Um, are we fully successful yet? No, we're not, but we're trying. <laughs> um, on putting the COI report into broader public circulation, I actually believe Justice Kirby has more information than, than me. Uh, what was the question? Um, the question is, are there plans to put the COI report ah. into broader public circulation? Yes. Well, um, first of all, uh, let me answer that. Um, the report um, should be published uh, in Chinese, for example. The, uh, they have published uh, the, the summary report, which is only about, uh, I think, 12 or 13, 14 pages, but not the full report. And the full report is the report that has the voices of the victims, and it's therefore um, a very powerful document and has never been published into, into Chinese. My understanding is that attempts are being made to get that done and uh, I, I'm, I'm, there's somebody in this audience today who has taken a part in that attempt. It is a worthy and honourable attempt and the people of China have an entitlement to know what the United Nations has uh, 
found, and uh, I'm, I've taken a note of where that is, and I'm going to pursue it. Uh, there's also a need <coughs> to publish the COI report in English, so it's at uh, bookstalls and at airports. Uh, I declare that it is a very readable report. Now, most UN reports are not readable. <laughs> but this is a very readable report. Every word of the report was weighed, and it is, um, it is, uh, it's actually a gripping read, and <laughs> it uh, ought to be on every, in every bookshop. Uh, and we are taking steps to try to get that to happen, uh, and uh, with a few photographs of the COI and uh, very, very nice and flattering photographs of the chair uh, and uh, of our hearings and so on. And um, I think it would, it would be a, a, a good seller. And it ought to be there for the purpose of the study of the methodology. Now, some people find methodology boring, but the methodology of this COI was absolutely integral to carrying people with, carrying news media with, carrying the international community and interest with what we were finding in our public hearings. And uh, all of that is something which I think makes it important that the whole report should be more available. Now, as to the uh, business uh, of the veto and China, I, I was simply giving the raw statistics. No doubt there are a whole series of explanations as to why China has such a very low statistic. There is a view that the way the charter was intended to operate, uh, I mean, that is to say, if you take an original intent view of uh, fundamental documents, which as a judge I didn't take, uh, uh, but uh, if you do take that, then the original intent, I think, was if a country, one of the great powers, if the P5 use the veto, then that's its entitlement, but it then has to face the opprobrium uh, of uh, the international community and international media, and, and maybe that is what should happen. But when I ra have raised this with American friends, they say, you've got to be careful that you don't get into a situation where vetoes are used all the time and the institution of the United Nations is thereby damaged by <clears throat> the fact that it's not really seen to work. And therefore, you have to be prudent in the use of the so-called veto. And I can understand that point of view as well. So it would not be illegitimate of a country, be it the United States of America or China, to talk to other members of the council and to decide well, this is not a matter we're going to press at this stage. But there is enough in the self-interest of the People's Republic of China in a stable neighbour to make it really reconsider the uh, situation of North Korea. Um, they uh, have wanted to have continue the buffer. But if the buffer is controlled by a violent... Uh, and human rights disrespecting uh, regime, then a point will be reached where quiet discussions may lead to something fruitful. Mm -hmm. It may not be the ICC, it may not be everything that is wanted, uh, but there are other steps that could be taken, and I'd rather take it that's what Marzuki Darisman in his last report has said we should be looking at. What are the other possibilities. And um, if they are possibilities that point to accountability, that is not a bad message to be bringing into uh, the leadership in North Korea, that ultimately they may be accountable. And I think that is a message I think it's important to, uh, to continue, and I, I therefore support what uh, Masuki Darisman. He's been a wonderful colleague. Uh, in the High Court of Australia, we had all sorts of differences all the time, the judges, a bit like the US Supreme Court. But uh, in the COI, with our different backgrounds, very different backgrounds and interests, 
uh, we uh, brought our report in unanimously, uh, on time, within budget, and uh, we remain friends after the exercise. And you can, <laughs> you can take the boy out of North Korea, but you can't take the Korean Peninsula and its people out of the boy. The Korean Peninsula will always be with the three members of the COI and let it be said with their wonderful secretariat. We had a most devoted uh, and able and brilliant secretariat and everything we asked for was ultimately done. And that's how we citizens of free countries like to think the UN operates and certainly on this exercise it does and uh, Sina is now the continuing uh, uh, face of the mandate of the United Nations and I, I'm sure we're going to see more productive work in the future. Wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have any more time for questions at this moment. Is, uh, is the secretary here yet? Okay, so we, why don't we just take a quick uh, five minute break and then we will be joined in a moment by uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Malinowski. Please give a round of applause for our <laughs> panel. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ambassador Joyce. Oh, they'll, they'll take yeah. care of <laughs> How do you do? Yes, you can borrow me. So, uh, um, he's not here yet. I'll give you a... Is he here? Yeah, the assistant secretary. Okay. okay. We'll, go, we'll go down okay. and out. So he's not here yet? Oh. Concept paper. I'm sorry? Science, science and technology exchange. Yes. Find it interesting. Oh, I good. Yes, yeah. sir. The one thing that uh, North Korea takes pride in. Yes. Oh, so, of course they do. Yes. But it has a lot more legs than than yeah. our exchanges. So yeah. Thank you so much. I was hoping to ask you about a more specific issue. When we uh, did our report, I think you want the microphone back.
Hello everyone, we'll be getting started shortly. If you could please take your seats, thank you. Folks, if we could get the room in order again, please. Thank you all for uh, participating in this morning's session. Thank you for taking your seats, getting your coffee and taking your seats, please. Thank you. So I thought the uh, the session this morning, uh, uh, the sessions this morning, went quite well, um, and now we have the opportunity to hear from uh, Assistant Secretary Tom Malinowski. Um, <clears throat> the, Assistant Secretary Malinowski, as one can imagine, has an extremely busy schedule. He's actually leaving the country today, but he was kind enough to join us this morning uh, to offer some remarks about uh, the uh, human rights and, uh, and North Korea. <clears throat> um, let me properly introduce him to you. Um, Tom Malinowski was sworn in as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor in 2014. Uh, previously, uh, uh, from 2001, he was the Washington Director for Human Rights Watch, uh, one of the world's leading independent international organizations dedicated to defending and protecting human rights. Uh, prior to that, Tom served as Senior Director on the National Security Council at the White House uh, for uh, strategic communications, uh, and previous to that, he had worked with both Secretaries of State Warren Christopher and Madeleine Albright uh, as a speechwriter and as a member of the policy planning staff. Um, again, he had a very busy schedule, but he was kind enough to join us this morning. He's going to offer some initial remarks, and uh, if there's time, also take a few questions. So, again, on behalf of all the uh, partners of this conference, Tom, the CSIS, um, HRNK, the Bush Institute, the National Endowment for Democracy, and Yonsei University Center for Human Liberty. We want to thank you for joining us and look forward to your remarks. Hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Victor, uh, for um, organizing all this and having me uh, here. And it's, it's such a privilege for me to join such a wonderful group of committed activists and uh, policymakers who, who care about North Korea. I want to thank the folks at CSIS, at HRNK, GWBI, NED. Have I used all the letters of the alphabet yet? I think almost. And, uh, and the Yonsei Center for Human Liberty for 
putting uh, together this conference. And I also want to recognize uh, my friend, Judge Kirby, who has become kind of a, a hero to me for combining two qualities that don't always go together, being principled and being effective. Your work has been noticed. Your work has had an amazing impact. And I think it is, in many ways, the starting point for um, what I want to say today. Because I think we have a, a chance now to reflect on the milestones that we have achieved in the two years since the Commission of Inquiry released its uh, historic uh, report, and, and to think about how to try to carry that momentum forward. It, it wasn't long ago when I think the conventional wisdom among North Korea watchers was that the regime in Pyongyang was completely impervious to outside pressure on human rights. North Korea just ignored international criticism and completely refused to cooperate with international human rights bodies. But I think the report has been a game changer in that respect. First of all, it set the record straight in a way that nobody in the international community uh, could challenge. On the urgency of the problem, it was clear. North Korea does not have any parallel in the contemporary world. On the scope and severity of the problem, it made clear that systemic, widespread, and gross human rights violations have been and are being committed by the DPRK. And on who is responsible, crimes against humanity have been committed pursuant to policies established at the highest levels of the state. And these findings have been accepted by the overwhelming majority of countries in the world. But what's, I think, particularly interesting has been the reaction of the leadership in Pyongyang. In the last two years, the government there has launched an aggressive campaign to counter the report's findings and to defend its record. And I think that reaction proves the point that all regimes, and if this is true of the DPRK, then we really can say all regimes, crave on some level to be seen as legitimate. I think their response has demonstrated that this regime is plainly vulnerable to any effort that makes it appear less legitimate to its people and to the world. In fact, one of the, the most illuminating and also disturbing passages in the Commission's report um, reveals that the, the Supreme Leader of the DPRK has issued standing orders to kill all labor camp inmates, quote, in the case of war or revolution, in order to eradicate the primary evidence of the existence of the camps and the conditions prevailing therein. Now, a regime willing to go to such lengths to cover up its human rights violations must on some level recognize that they are a source of shame for which it could be held accountable. And that in and of itself tells us how important it is to continue to shine a light on what is happening inside North Korea. Now, of course, we all know that we are having this discussion at a moment when the international community is once again focused on the threat posed by North Korea's nuclear program. The Obama administration believes that we can and must address both the country's nuclear ambitions and its grave human rights violations. In fact, Many of the country's human rights abuses underwrite its weapons program, including forced labor through mass mobilizations, political prisoners and overseas labor contracts, and food distribution policies that favor the military and lead to chronic malnourishment among its citizens. I think history has also shown us, the history of the Cold War, for example, that while we can and must seek to manage and minimize such threats to our security through diplomacy, through sanctions, through strong support for our allies. The problem is not likely to be solved until the people of North Korea have more of a say in deciding their future. So what should our strategy be to get there? First, we should continue to make clear to the leadership, from those at the top to the middle ranks, 
that we know what they are doing and that they can be held accountable if at some point in the future things change on the Korean Peninsula. This can help, even if only on the margins, to deter some of the worst abuses that these people commit. Second, as we message from the top down, we should do everything we can to facilitate the flow of information to, from, and among North Koreans from the bottom up. This can help accelerate the trends already underway in North Korea that could lead to internal change and simultaneously to prepare the North Korean people for the enormous challenges that they are going to face if such change comes. Now, with respect to the first part of this challenge, as I mentioned, the COI report has already helped us greatly. We will, we will keep up the drumbeat, and I'm confident that other nations will continue to join us, exposing human rights abuses, demanding accountability, and where possible, singling out specific individuals within the regime who bear direct responsibility. I have a feeling that there are people within the North Korean leadership who recognize that the future of their regime is uncertain, that one day the peninsula may look very different, and they may be thinking about their personal prospects in such a scenario. We want to make sure that they understand that their prospects will be far poorer if they become personally associated with the worst aspects of the regime's repression, like the labor camp system. Now, with respect to the second part of the challenge, breaking the DPRK's monopoly on information, there is much we are doing and more we can do. Since the late 1950s, as you all know, the regime has taken extreme measures to exert total control over information. I think North Korea is probably the only totalitarian country in the world that managed to do this long enough to deny most of its adult population knowledge or memory of the existence of alternative ways of life. The defector Lee Hyun So described the bizarre alternative reality created by this propaganda in her memoir, The Girl with Seven Names. She wrote, leaving North Korea is not like leaving any other country. It's more like leaving another universe. And we should remember that this control of information was absolutely central to the regime's survival over the years. For if North Koreans knew that there was not only another world, but another Korea where people lived better and freer lives, what justification would there be for the continuation of a separate system in the North? Slowly but surely, that control is weakening. South Korean DVDs, MP3s, cell phones, tablets are all now available in North Korea. South Korean soap operas and foreign films have exposed the regime's lies by showing the affluence of normal life in other countries. Traders crossing the border into China, workers assigned to overseas labor contracts, and the growing defector community in the South are sharing stories with family members. Now, a lot has changed in this realm of information dissemination since Soviet dissidents hand-copied banned books for distributions. <clears throat> Today, micro SD cards that can store thousands of books on something this big can be copied in seconds and distributed discreetly. A Chinese DVD player can be purchased for as little as $20, and DVDs themselves are less than a dollar. Notels, attached screen DVD players, which were recently legalized in North Korea, are less than $50 and have SD and USB slots and built-in TV and radio tuners. Flash drives that can be quickly removed from TVs and DVD players are cheap and abundant. There are now three million cell phone contracts in North Korea, and recent defector surveys demonstrate that before leaving the DPRK, more than 92% of survey participants had watched a foreign DVD, more than 70% had access to a mobile phone. Nearly 30% have listened to a foreign radio broadcast. So here's what happens. A young woman selling the latest South Korean fashion accessories in the market breaks free from economic reliance on the government. And just like that, an idea forms, independence begins, 
which the government can do nothing to stop. A DVD containing a bootleg copy of Rocky shows not just a boxing ring, but a refrigerator full of food, revealing a life utterly different from that lived by the average North Korean. And again, an idea forms, independence begins, the government can do nothing about it. A cell phone allows a family in Pyongyang to talk to their relatives in Seoul, even to receive transfers of money, which raises their standard of living, changes their perception of a foreign country, and again, an idea forms, independence begins, and there's nothing that the government can do to stop it. The more this information gets inside, the more people's appetite for knowledge increases. A chasm forms between traditional state propaganda and people's understanding of the world. It becomes harder for the government to hide the truth about the country's relative poverty and the reasons for it. So, amidst all of the horrors that we know well and that continue, we do see opportunities. And in this context, my charge from my boss, from Secretary Kerry, is to keep it up and to step it up and to do more, so we will. We will continue to expand our support of information programs, whether it is a report on human rights or a movie about a doomed ship crossing the Atlantic or the latest Girls' Generation song, we're going to get it into North Korea. People are going to see it and hear it, giving the people of the country more options, more ideas, greater independence of thought. We're going to explore, with the help of some people in this room, new technologies that will help us move information faster and safer to show the average North Korean that there is an alternative way of life. Going forward, we will continue to ratchet up the pressure through various UN bodies. We're gearing up right now for the March session of the UN Human Rights Council, which will offer another strong message about accountability. And we will continue to seek opportunities to highlight the egregious human rights violations committed by the North Korean regime. To the men who are commanders of the camp, camps and to their commanders, and to other officials all the way to the top, our message remains, we see you, we know who you are, we know what you are doing. Wherever possible, we will say your names out loud, and eventually there will be consequences. Now, hundreds of defectors continue to participate in efforts to raise awareness about all these issues, including Grace Jo, who I understand is on one of the panels later this afternoon. Grace was in New York in December when the UN Security Council held its second deliberation on the situation in the human rights situation in the DPRK. She, along with another defector, Zhang Guang Il, bravely stood up in the council chambers as our UN ambassador, Samantha Power, described their suffering under the regime's oppressive policies. Grace, like many other defectors, like many other survivors, witnessed generations of her family starve. Hunger drove her and her surviving family members to try to escape North Korea. They were returned repeatedly against their will. As punishment, she was sent to an orphanage where she said people were forced to work from six in the morning till seven at night. She and her remaining two family members finally managed to escape in 2008 when they came to the United States as refugees. Now, when I think about those kinds of stories, and we've all heard so many um, that are so poignant and, and so horrifying, I, I feel a, a sense of anger, obviously, um, determination to try to do more about this problem, but it also gives me, in a, in a funny way, a sense of, of hope, because when you think about what people like that have endured and survived, and how they have still emerged strong and confident and willing and able to speak to us in a foreign language, in a strange land, about what they experienced and their ability to understand perfectly, completely, a set of ideals and values that for their entire life in North Korea they were 
told did not exist. That gives me a lot of hope about the future of their country. If they could go through that, if they could survive that, then surely the 20 million plus people in North Korea who experience these things every day have a chance with our help to endure what they are going through and ultimately in the future to build a normal country in which people have the freedom to go about their lives as they were born to do. And that, I think, should inspire us to keep on working uh, towards that goal. I have such admiration for, for those of you who have been at this for years and years, and in some cases, decades. And I would say to you that, that every fight for human rights that I've ever been involved with has seemed quixotic when I've been in the middle of it. Every single sound strategy I've ever been involved with seemed like a complete abject failure until it succeeded. And then we looked back with the help of historians and journalists and we pieced together, oh yeah, it actually was working at the time when we thought that it was a complete failure. And I'm confident that we will get to that point in North Korea at some point soon. And if we keep at it, it will be sooner, not later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. That was great. Very strong message and also very inspiring um, based on your past experiences working on other cases. The Assistant Secretary has a little bit of time for a couple of questions, so we'll open the floor. If you could identify yourself and, again, make it a question. No speeches. That would be very much uh, appreciated. So, uh, yes, here. I'm Yoshi Komori of the uh, Japanese paper, New, uh, Sankei Shimba. Mr. Secretary, would you care to comment on the U.S. citizen David Schneiderman, uh, who's suspected to be to have been abducted by North Korean government agents from a Yunnan province of China to Pyongyang? As you might know, the congressional resolution, based on the possibility of the abduction, was introduced to the both houses of U.S. Congress last week. So, if you have any comment or reaction, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to comment on the cases of U.S. citizens. As you know, that's uh, when these cases arise, when I'm not referring to anything in particular, very, very sensitive, and, and our focus is on trying to make sure we can get our folks back. And I think public comments tend not to be helpful. Okay. Uh, yes, here. It seems to me the most distinguished and uh, salient accomplishment of COI is the word accountability. With accountability, when and if there's anything like Nuremberg happens, we'll have a base on the basis of which to prosecute who is guilty. And also letting them know they'll be one day accountable, so like the promise of hell, make people behave a little better in life. Now, two things. One is accountability has other consequences. Those elites who will be accountable later may behave that little better as a result of knowing this accountability. The other is uh, they will work harder to maintain the regime so that they will not have, be held accountable. Is there an issue about that? The second is uh, when Secretary John Kerry gave you that message about how to infiltrate North Korea's wall uh, of uh, information block, is there anything you have received from the Secretary to move in some way toward unification, which is the ultimate answer? To human rights violations. In, in terms of how accountability may happen, uh, we, you know, we're not, it's hard to say right now. We would support um, referring the situation to an international court like the ICC. Uh, we know realistically that that's not likely to happen uh, right now because North Korea is not a member, unsurprisingly, and the Security Council would likely face a veto if, uh, if it actually uh, moved uh, to make that happen. Um, but I, I think the experience of past situations suggests that um, even if in the short run one may not see a 
uh, an immediate viable path to holding perpetrators of, of these kinds of crimes accountable. Eventually, history has a way of catching up to them, um, whether it's a change in the international environment which allows for an international body to play that role, or um, frankly, going to the very end of your question, reunification, uh, which I think many of us see as uh, one way or another um, a likely uh, outcome on the Korean Peninsula. And I believe many officials in the North Korean regime, I think on some level, must understand that that is a possible outcome. At which point, of course, all kinds of domestic mechanisms uh, would become uh, available. Now, on the, the, the second question you raised, is it helpful to have that threat out there? Uh, we often have this debate in such situations. And my, my view is that um, the, uh, the, the leadership of the DPRK, the people who are deeply embedded in this regime, are going to do everything they can to preserve it, whether there is talk of accountability out there or not. The stakes for them are huge, with or without the potential of some tribunal in uh, the future. So I, I don't think uh, talking about accountability is going to make them fight, uh, fight harder. Um, what I do hope is that the prospect that this may be possible in the future will focus their minds now in a way that can deter, as I mentioned in my speech, at least on the margins, some of the worst abuses. What I want is that middle, I want that middle ranking person in the bureaucracy who is thinking, should I shoot for a position in an economic ministry or I shoot for a position in the security ministry where I may be overseeing the labor camps? I want that guy to be thinking, you know what? I don't want to get on Judge Kirby's list <laughs> because someday, you know, we may, we may come to a point in this country where people like me are, are going to have a chance, because we know that in, in moments of political change, reunification of Germany, elites in the former regime sometimes can do pretty well for themselves, right? Because they have the money and power now. If they play the game in a smart way, they may actually end up perfectly fine in a future reunified Korean Peninsula but not if they're on that list. And so I want them to think about that now in situations where they might have a choice. Do I participate in an execution? Do I do something terrible? Do I work here? Do I work there? Um, so that's, that's the idea here. Um, yes, here. Uh, Peter Humphrey, Intel analyst and former diplomat. I'm wondering if it might be possible to engage the Chinese now um, to alleviate their fears. That is to say, maybe promise a uh, UN safe zone along the Tumen River for the flood of refugees that'll come. And maybe promise no American military bases north of the 38th. Is that a discussion we could have now with the Chinese? Uh, in a reasonable world, yes. <laughs> um, I think, you know, uh, I, I haven't sensed much willingness on their part to have that kind of discussion, although I think one could argue that it would be in everybody's interest um, to do that because we have no intention of um, realizing their worst fears. Uh, we want stability and peace on the Korean Peninsula, as does China. and. Um, I'm not sure if putting off these difficult questions is necessarily the best way to ensure for the long term the stability and peace that China legitimately wants to see. So it's a good question. Uh, Mark Tokla. Yeah, the new U.S. Uh, sanctions legislation on North Korea includes a human rights element. Uh, do you see that as a significant new tool in trying to promote the human rights agenda? And how do you intend to use it? The, the president's uh, most recent executive order uh, authorizing sanctions uh, includes 
a human rights prong. Um, so we actually beat Congress to the punch. Uh, and, um, and we do intend to use it. And I think I alluded in my remarks to our desire uh, to name people, to be able to send really to the middle ranks above all precisely the message that I was discussing with the, the, the gentleman who asked the question about accountability. I, I don't, this is not about um, finding the camp commander who has a bank account in New York, um, but it can be a way of delivering the message that we know who those people are and that there is a list. It's a list that um, it's not in their interest to be on. Um, that said, uh, it's not as easy as one might want to be able to know exactly who all those people are. I mean, we know who the leader of North Korea is, but I think what's more interesting is getting down into the ranks, the ministers, the deputy ministers, the commanders of the various facilities um, uh, to give us a picture of, a, a deeper picture of who is involved in uh, what we know to be the worst aspects of repression in the country. But, but as we um, conduct that kind of inquiry, we will be in a better position to employ um, the sanctions authority in, in a way that I think could have a little bit of impact. Uh, I saw there was a, yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm a master's student at Georgetown University. My question is regards to um, the responsibility to protect and the question of intervention. Uh, I'm wondering how, you know, we've seen over the past decade the responsibility to protect become more of a, a norm and a principle, and I'd be curious to hear how North Korea ties into the implementation of the R2P and, and the question of intervention. When would intervention be justified um, under the principle of R2P? Thank you. Uh, as candid as I like to be, I'll probably avoid <laughs> speculating about conditions for armed intervention uh, in Korea or anywhere else. I, I would say that R2P as a principle applies in a general sense to a lot of situations, that the principle is not, it, it doesn't actually um, revolve exclusively around the question of military intervention. The principle is simply that when a country fails in its responsibility to protect its own people, we have a collective responsibility as an international community to try to do something, but it doesn't specify exactly what should be done. And it recognizes that there are many different tools that, uh, that governments like ours have to try to meet our part of the R2P bargain. There are diplomatic tools, there are sanctions tools, uh, there are ways to provide direct assistance to victims uh, of human rights abuses. And then in the most extreme circumstances where um, it is possible to make a difference through a more direct intervention and our interests allow it, then we have those very painful conversations. I, I think in North Korea, we are focused on the kinds of um, measures and strategies that I discussed uh, in my remarks. We are, of course, always open to uh, ideas from from others who follow the situation closely. And I would hope, you know, when I was talking about the stuff we're doing, for example, to get information into the country, I hope you all are thinking about uh, helping us uh, to think through um, the best way to do that. I hear good ideas, creative ideas all the time. And one has to be creative to, to, do, this, uh, to do this well. So um, please send us your ideas. Hell, even send us your grant proposals. Um, and keep pushing us to, to do it because I think although we're doing a lot of really interesting things, the potential is, uh, is far greater. Um, so Tom, on behalf of all the partners of, for, this, uh, for this conference, this project, we really want to thank you for taking the time to joining us um, and sending such a strong message and also words of inspiration for everybody who's working on the issue. Thank so you. Thank you very much. All thank right. You.